All right, this is a home interview, Lake George, New York, the 22nd of September, 2005, approximately 1.15 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Okay. Uh, my full name is John J. Blanchfield. I was born in Schenectady, New York, on March the 10th, 1924. I'm usually known as Jack. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I graduated from St. Mary's Institute in Amsterdam in 1941. And I entered Niagara University in the fall of 41. And of course, uh, Pearl Harbor took place in December of 41. I was not eligible for draft or anything until 42. At which time in, uh, in May, I registered for the draft. And then in December of 42, I, the recruiter came to Niagara and came from the uh, enlistment uh, corps. And if we enlisted at that point in time, they would guarantee that we could finish the next semester which I did December the 8th of 1942. And in May of 43, as I completed my second semester of my second year at Niagara, uh, I received notice that I was expected at Camp Upton. Uh, okay, do you uh, remember where you were and uh, your reaction, also how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah, I gone to, it was a Sunday, and uh, I had gone to the movies at Niagara Falls with four of my buddies and classmates. And uh, as we left the movies that afternoon, we stopped uh, waiting for a bus in front of Walgreens Drugstore on Fall Street. And somebody came up to us and did you hear what happened at Pearl Harbor? And that was our first knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. And we were quite startled. We were all ROTC units. Uh, we had to take ROTC at that at Niagara. So uh, we were startled to hear it. We didn't know what was going to happen to us. We went back for supper that night. Being Sunday, we just had cold cuts and salads. And it was deadly quiet. Some of the fellows knew that they were going to go professors we're leaving, and it was an all-male school. It, it was mm -hmm. a lot of pensive people there at that point. What's going to happen? What are we? What can we do? And it was pretty much the demise of male students at Niagara until after the war. Okay, where did you go for your basic training? Fort McClellan. Alabama, mm -hmm. 13 weeks, uh, infantry, and at the conclusion of that, why, uh, I took a test for OCS or ASTP, the Army Specialized Training Program, as we call it. Some other people call it all safe till peace. <laughs> At that point in time, like if I was then sent to uh, Clemson College in South Carolina, where I stayed for about a week, and I met a fellow there who was, his name was Richie Johnson, who was a famous Negro uh, baseball player at that point. He's now buried in Amsterdam. And from there, I was assigned to North Carolina State College in Raleigh. And I started courses in engineering in the fall of 1943. Completed that two semesters in March of 44 when ASTP was disbanded. And I think I heard that there were about 40,000 of us in different colleges throughout the country. 
either in training for uh, or studying to be engineers or doctors or medical people. And from there I found myself in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Clemson, Fort Jackson, Columbia, South Carolina, with the 87th or ACORN Division. And that was, of course, prior to D-Day. It was B-44. Okay, um, did you gain specialized training at all when you were placed with that division? No, no. I mm -hmm. was a uh, PFC at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So even with all the, the background you had, they still had you as a PFC? Yeah, a oh. PFC, uh, infantryman. Mm -hmm. All right, now, um, so you were with the 87th Division? At that point. At yeah. that point, uh, could you tell us about your your time with them and, and what happened to you? Well, we, we were um, getting ready for something, and uh, as an infantryman, of course, we used various firearms and so on. And I was with them a short period of time until uh, just before D-Day, or after, just after D-Day, I had a 10-day furlough. And I came back to Amsterdam in the hometown for 10 days and went back. And on the way back, I met Sergeant, Sergeant Kirby, who was our, our sergeant of our company C. And he said, you've been enlisted to go over as replacement. So he said, you'll be packing up your duds and you'll be out of here. And which took place then in the summer of 44. Look, how did you uh, go overseas? Uh, through various stops, I finally ended up at Camp Shanks, which is uh, down in Orange County, I believe. And I, I was stationed there for maybe a couple of weeks or so. Uh, had some time to go to New York City. My mother and father came down. They knew I was shipping out, and uh, shortly thereafter, I was. I, put aboard the Mauritania, which was an English uh, liner at that point in time. My grandmother Blanchfield said she came to the United States uh, in 1870-something uh, on the Mauritania, but it was a liner and it was jammed with GIs. Uh, I slept in a hammock and we had a half an hour a day to go up on deck. Uh, took us seven days, no convoy. We were by ourselves, we were nice. speedboat. Took yeah. seven days here over there. Uh, ended up in Liverpool, uh, disbarked, and was sent to a place called Delamere Park. The trucks took us there, which was someplace in the area of, of Liverpool. And uh, I was there about a week when I got noticed that uh, we were, I was going to Southampton and we were going to head to France. At Southampton, I uh, was put aboard a ship from the Netherlands uh, called New Amsterdam, which was kind of surprising that I was on that kind of a ship. And we went across the channel that, that night and we were off the coast of France the next late morning when they threw all the ropes over the side of the uh, ship, climbed down into an LCI, landing craft infantry, I think it was, rather than an LST, which took us to uh, the shores of Omaha Beach. And there was a metal ramp like that was in the, in the water. It was high tide. And we had full field packs, M1s, gas masks, the whole bit. So over the side I went into this LCI and uh, went towards shore and the front came down. And we marched, started walking off and I found out in high tide, I'm about five foot five at that point in time, I damn near drowned. The water was up to my chest the guy in back of me grabbed me by my touche and said, keep walking, keep walking. By that time, I'm spitting water out, couldn't swim, 
and I thought to myself, boy, the, when the Germans see me as a new secret weapon coming out <laughs> of the water, they are really going to be in for a time. So we landed, I, I walked up Omaha Beach, and the first thing we did was throw away our gas mask. And there was a rise from, from the beach itself, which we climbed up. And at that point in time, they were just opening up the new graves. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what date was this when you went on? D uh, went on there. Uh, it was probably around the 1st of August. Okay. Okay. Was there any evidence of the battle at all? Did no, you see anything? No. It had been pretty well cleaned up by mm -hmm. then, uh, except for the, uh, the grave sites. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were just beginning to put crosses and, and stars of David on it. Mm -hmm. And I found out later that uh, one of my classmates from St. Mary's in Amsterdam had been killed on D-Day and was being buried there, which kind of shook me a bit. Mm -hmm. So, continue from there? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, from there, we got, got on trucks and were sent to what they called a repo depot, replacement depot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we were there for uh, I don't know, maybe 10 days, two weeks or so. When my n name was called and I was ordered to report, so I was being shipped to uh, Company C of the 11th Regiment of the 5th Division, which was part of the 3rd Army. The 5th Division had been in uh, Iceland and then to North Ireland and then into France, so I was being sent to them. I put on trucks and taken to Company C of the 11th. And at that point in time, they stenciled a red diamond on my helmet. And then from there, we, uh, uh, we took off. The Third Army had, had not been in existence very long. And Patton was our general. Did you ever get to see him? Never saw him. What were your feelings about him as a general? He was a heck of a good general. A little bit wild, I guess, because all we did was run like crazy, and we had the Germans on the run. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we didn't see much combat for quite a while. Uh, we get stopped periodically at uh, remains of various towns and so on. I just remember the first time I, I had an 88 shot over me. And, and with all the training and everything I had, the only thing I could do was just hold on to my helmet and say, Hail Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Scared me to death. And the first shot I took was, uh, we were held up outside of a small village and we, uh, so we are behind this, some little bunker type thing. And the sergeant hollered over to me, shoot, and shoot. Me, I hadn't shot my M1 yet. I shot him and I, I hit a house. And uh, I thought, boy, I'm, I'm really doing a good job. But we kept, kept going uh, what, uh, east. At a fast pace, and our, our tanks were, were were everything. They they had the Germans really on the run. Periodically, we get stopped by a, a small group of Germans, and they'd fire at us a while, and then they'd disappear. If we'd come to a village that, that we stayed overnight, why well, that was fine. If we came to a village once in a while, we could pin down for a while. The next morning, everything was quiet. They were gone. The tanks were gone well until we got uh, close to the Moselle River. And this was probably early, mid-September, something like that. And then we, we, were, we were ordered to dig foxholes. We'd been sleeping in slit trenches every chance we had. But then they said, start digging deeper. And uh, uh, the question then was, why? Because we've been on the run. We had the Germans on the run. And uh, the answer was uh, the tanks have run out of gas. Uh, we both stretched our lines of 
what we needed. And uh, so once the tanks were stopped, like we were stopped. We were there for a while, then, then in October, early October, uh, the rains came. It rained, and it rained, and it rained. And our objective at that point was to take the city of Metz, which was on the Moselle River, and periodically we'd send out patrols. I'd, I'd go out and patrol, and periodically I'd send out outposts. And Metz was uh, pretty well fortified by what was known as Fort Rian, which was part of the original Maginot Line. But Fort Rian was just more than one fort, it was a number of forts. And periodically we'd go out and make an attack, I think maybe twice, and we were always repelled, we went right back. In the middle of October, they took us offline, and uh, we went in the rest area, went back up to a little village, I think it was Verzon, I think it was -R -Z -O -N, something like that. Took us back there, where we had a chance to uh, clean ourselves up a bit and get some heavier uh, clothing. And uh, we were relieved at that point, I think, by the 95th. And then the uh, the end of October, we went back up on line. And uh, on the 4th of November, uh, a sergeant came to me and he said, uh, uh, Company A has been hit, got hit pretty hard a couple of nights ago. And we're going to need some help. I want you to go over and, and report to them temporarily. So I went over and reported to Company A, which was just a little bit south of where we were, where I was, and uh, reported to them. And it was a Saturday, the, the 4th of November. And they said, okay, first thing you're going to do is you're going on outpost. We're going to shoot you, put you up on outpost. And I met a fellow who I was going with, uh, a fellow, I think it was Cooch, something like that. From, Vermont. So we went up on outpost, which I guess everybody knew it was ahead of everybody else, and we were supposed to be in charge of reporting any activity. They said no patrols were out at that point in time. But, but uh, we were out, and Cooch and I were in one hole, and to our left flank, maybe just ahead of us, a wee bit, with two other guys. And uh, as usual on outpost, you, you sleep two hours and stay awake two hours, mm -hmm. just flip flop. So about mid, I went from uh, 10 to midnight with my, my tour, and as I went back to sleep, just shortly after I went back to sleep, Cooch uh, said, uh, we've got company. Well, we knew there were no patrols, no out, so it wasn't anybody that we wanted to see right then. And, uh, yep, it was right. We. Uh, there was a combat patrol hit us, and uh, we had a phone with us. We had, uh, they had sent us up with pork chops and a boiled potato, and uh, so I had something to eat, and that comes, comes important later on. But uh, we had a pretty good firefight, and Cooch was killed. Uh, and. Right behind me, I, well, the phone was cut. I, I, we tried to use the phone, and that was cut. We just had our M1s, and they had uh, Germans, you know, they had grease guns, as we used to call them. Uh, they gave us pretty good battles. They said Cooch was killed. And, and I knew somebody was behind us because the phone was gone. And the next thing I know, I heard some voice say, Rouse, call me Rouse. Hands up. So that was the end of it. Combat at my point in time. Now you were wounded also? Yeah. I hit by uh, some shrapnel, mm -hmm. one of their potato mashers, as we call their, their grenades. Um, and about as close to combat as, as I had ever expected because it was just a few yards away from each other. 
the fellas in the other hole, I, I do believe, got killed also. Because I, I know there was a, a lot of firing over there, too. But kind of thinking back about it, I, I, I all, always wonder why they left us out there. Like I said, in fact, we were just, we were there to stop them or get killed or something. And later on, my father and mother got a letter that uh, they did know of, uh, later stating that, that, that I was on outpost and there was a firefight. And they came out the next morning and found that uh, none of us were there. Well, that at least I wasn't there. So I got captured. And uh, it was the German First Army that we were against, and we were a couple SS troopers, which were good soldiers. The Germans were real good soldiers. So they marched me, and we, we weren't too far from the German front line, because they had, they had a chance to regroup, as, as we did. So they marched me past a bunch of uh, German Wehrmacht who started hooting and hollering and, and calling different names and so on. And uh, a lot of words that I, I didn't know what they meant, but I don't think they were very kind. They, uh, the guys that picked me up, uh, captured me, I guess, uh, checked on me over for cigarettes and for D-bars. That's what they wanted. So. They took those away from me. Now, can I ask you a second? What sure, kind of winter gear did you have? At that point in time, I, I had long underwear. I had a, a, the uh, winter uh, uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a small skull cap that you wore underneath your, right. your helmet. Uh, I had gloves, and I had a field jacket. So I was not in too bad shape. How about point. your boots? What did you? Boots were the same. Just the combat. We didn't. We did not have combat boots. Oh. This is this is something that I've seen on, on everything on D Day. The guys did not have combat boots. We wore leggings. So you just had like the ankle top boot. We did have the ankle top boot. That mm -hmm. was it. And then of course the legging that you you'd lace up. And right. Stuff. And of course the. the Helmet with the big red diamond on. Mm -hmm. So they, they took me to. Uh, we walked quite a ways, and they took me to a uh, a brick house and brought me in there. And, and it must have been a central place or something because there's all kinds of telegraph lines and, and uh, almost like movie stuff. Of people marching in and out with information. Do you have another question, Mike? No, no. 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 Do you want me to just keep yes. rambling? Mm -hmm. Yes. You're doing well. Uh, so they took me in there, and then they took me uh, to another room and uh, started asking me some questions. And of course, I was, I was still a PFC at that point in time. And Eisenhower hadn't told me anything. And uh, I didn't have much information to give them except who I name, rank, and serial number. They knew what division I came from because I had the red diamond on my helmet. Periodically, they'd get upset with me and they'd give me a little jab with a bayonet once in a while. But otherwise, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. They locked me into a room, and the next morning, uh, two guys with skulls and crossbones which, on, on their uniforms put me in the back of what could be the German version of a jeep in the back seat, and uh, one guy sat next to me, and the other guy was driving. They tied my hands behind me, and we took off. Uh, we came to a small stream, and this German vehicle, the, the driver, shifted gears of some sort, and it became a, a floating jeep, and we. As a little boat went across this stream or whatever it was. We got to, we drove most uh, maybe four or five hours. 
and we stopped at a place where, and they put me in, locked me in a barn, and they brought me some meat, a piece of potato, and they brought in a young fellow from Yugoslavia, young fellow. And of course, at that point, 1944, I just turned 20. This guy was probably about 16 or 17. They put him in a barn with me, and uh, he said something in his language, and I couldn't understand him. And then we went through a couple of different things. The next thing I knew, he could speak French. Yeah, so he asked me an awful lot of questions, and uh, which I started to wonder what the heck he was doing there and why. Couldn't answer many of them. Uh, so I fell asleep in a pile of straw and uh, woke up the next morning. He was gone. And he was locked in. And I often wondered why. I, I think it, it might have been quite interested in what was going on because I was picked up on Saturday night, the 4th of November. And on Tuesday, the following Tuesday, was uh, the 7th. It was election day back in the United States. And uh, Roosevelt was running for his fourth term against Tom Dewey. And among the questions they kept asking me was, were you getting ready to attack us? Because we've been sitting still for a few weeks. And I guess they were afraid that Roosevelt might pull an attack to maybe help solidify his possibility of becoming president mm -hmm. again, but it was his fourth term. And I often wondered if that was why that, that was the main point of their questions. So my two fellows with the skulls and crossbones picked me up again that morning, and they took me to a small, well, it was a town called Forbush. I found out later. And I was put in a town jail in a cell by myself. And after I was there for a while, I got some knocking on the, on the wall. And the fellow said, are you American? I said, yes. You? He said, yes. He was a, a fighter pilot. He got shot down, parachuted, and so on. And he'd been there for a couple of days in that jail. Uh, they eventually took him out, and, and I heard some screaming and hollering. He never came back. I don't know what ever happened to him. And I often wondered if some of the civilians maybe got to him, because they, they, they were notorious that way if they caught anybody. So from Forbush, I was there for maybe four or five days by myself in the jail. They took me out. One guard took me on a regular train and we went to Limburg, which was Stalin 12A. And at that place, we, uh, they took my picture and who I was. Uh, and I, I felt kind of secure at that point in time that I was a POW because there had been rumors, and it happened on our side too, that periodically POWs never made it. We never heard from him again. He became an MIA forever. But uh, once I had my picture taken and I got my uh, dog tag with my number on it, Null Siebenach, Null 9 and Zexig, 078 069. And Lindbergh was Stalin 12A, and uh, there were British, Canadians, Americans all POWs there. And I, I was there for, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe three weeks or so. Very boring, felt very sorry for myself for what had happened. Felt sorry for the guys that were with me when I got hit. Oh, by the way, I, I did the shrapnel. Uh, a German medic took, <laughs> cut the shrapnel out the biggest piece was in my elbow and sewed me up and they used it. They didn't have cloth bandages, they used crepe paper. They wrapped me up with crepe paper. Uh, 
I had a couple of little small pieces, but later on. But anyhow, I was there for uh, at Limburg for a while. And they took a bunch of us out and uh, put us on a train, a boxcar. There were 40 some of us. It was all uh, straw on the floor. And I'll, I'll keep going <coughs> as long as until you stop and you have a question, no. Mike, whatever. No, you're doing well. Uh, straw on the floor and a big garbage can in the corner. And there wasn't much room in it for 40 some guys. And there was one fellow from, I think he's from Chicago, that they, all he kept talking about all the time we were on that boxcar was his mother, banana cream pie. <laughs> and then for about four days in the boxcar, talking about him, about his cream, cream pie, banana cream pie. We would have shut him up. We, after a day, we, we took off in the train in the box and I think there were a couple of other box cars with GIs because when we did stop eventually uh, we met them and we'd stop periodically and they'd put another box car on now whether these were Jewish people that they were taken to someplace else I, I don't know every once in a, once in a while they, they had a little cubicle above the box car the, the guard up there would drop some water or some bread down to us we found out what the garbage can was there for after the second day. And then we really had problems. Uh, some of the guys drilled holes and with the dog tags to get the seepage out. And it, 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 was, it was horrible. We had, uh, yeah, about every third day, they'd sort of give us some bread. And, uh, We'd have to stand up. And everybody couldn't lie down at the same time. These boxcars were too small, so we had to stand up. We stopped some place, and we were there for a while. And when the, the Americans with daylight, they came over and bombed this railroad the yard, and we were screaming in the boxcar. We, we were the targets of our own, our own men. Fortunately, it didn't hit us. Anyhow, we stayed. We, the boxcar took, ride took us seven days. It was an absolute horror. And we, at one time they said we were going to what used to be was Danzig at that point in time. The German guy, the guard above, said we we're going to Danzig. We turned around apparently and came back. And we ended up at New Brandenburg, which is Mecklenburg. 30 some miles, probably north of Berlin. And they opened the doors to us and, and we, they let us out. And uh, uh, we were then herded into Stalag 2A, which was New Brandenburg, which had Russian prisoners besides British, and we were the first American prisoners to get in that. And it was a big camp, big prison camp. Uh, the first thing it gave us was cabbage soup, it was cabbage in water, and two slices of black bread. And most of us hadn't eaten much more than a slice of bread in, in over a week. So we devoured everything we got. And boy, did we pay for it about two days, the next day or two, we could have not eaten, and just get cabbage and everything else, it, it, it didn't do us any good. We. Uh, were taken into the camp, uh, and I was there for probably three or four weeks. We got to the camp on November 29th, the Thursday, which was Thanksgiving Day in the United States. We had two Thanksgiving days in 1944 in the United States. The original one, which was the last Thursday, and then we decided for some reason that they would have it the third Thursday. So we got there on, on, on Thanksgiving Day, the 29th. And after our time in, in uh, two-way, it got very boring, and I felt very sorry for myself. Didn't know what my mother and father knew, uh, where I was, what happened. Uh, so they came around and he said, uh, we're going to have work groups, and uh, so they, 
said anybody volunteer. So I volunteered and they picked up 20 of us. And they sent us to a place called uh, Gunnenwald, which was just outside of New Brandenburg, a few miles. They put us on trains to get there. They had two guards and the two elderly men and 20 of us. And among those um, that were, was with me is a fellow by the name of Jack Yole from Hudson Falls, whom I met at that point. But anyhow, we went to Dunnerwald and we were told then that we were put into a barracks, just a small one room, had a stove in it. We were put there and we were going to be stump rousers. They were building a, uh, a new road. And uh, the two elderly men that I had met on the train with the two guards, they were the guys in charge. Well, they, they took us out and they showed us where they had felled, knocked down trees, shot down, cut down trees, and uh, the stumps were left. So we had to dig around the stump, get the roots, and then they had a tripod such as the one that you're using. Today. And uh, you put the tripod down, put chains underneath the roots and everything, and then with the pump handle, you'd, mm -hmm. you'd pump them up. So that was our job. And we worked from dawn until dusk. And we got our usual breakfast of ersatz tea. At noontime, we either had potato soup or uh, cabbage soup or turnip soup. And at night, we got two slices of bread. And that was our food. Uh, at the time we were there, we had a, an interpreter with us, one of the 20, his name was Hank, he was from Brooklyn, a Jewish boy. And they came around one day and they checked our dog tags and they took Hank away from us. We never saw him again. We found out later that they did take uh, the uh, Jewish boys and put Jewish American boys. And so we had to play games with our dog tags. The Jewish boys always hid theirs or got rid of them somehow, and the rest of the guys would periodically hide their own to the Gentile ones. So we lost Hank, he went, he took off. And uh, a fellow by name is Nixon, he's from Colorado. No, I don't know if he's related to the future president, but uh, he, he, he and I were pretty good friends, and all of a sudden he flipped one time, and, and I woke up one night and we had to sleep on there were two layers, uh, uh, not separate beds, but straw, and then we had half a blanket to share. And uh, I woke up one night, and Nixon's staring over me, and he's, he's hollering, you know who I am? I said, I don't know who you are. He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Oh boy, he had really flipped. The next day, we're out, I'm getting up, walking out of the, the whole, stumping at me. And Nixon's standing over me. He clocks me in the jaw. So the guys grabbed him, broke him away, and took him away. And uh, the next night, he's standing over me again. He said, now, tonight I'm a spot on the wall. I'm watching everything you do. They took him, they let him work the next day. And as I was in my hole, he took a shovel and he beat me with, on my back with a shovel, three shots until the guys got him. So I was, they took him away. He went on the back of the truck and I still can see him screaming going on. Whatever happened to him, I, him, I don't know. But I, I was, I had a word, but the guys covered for me. I couldn't do anything. They covered for me. So after, uh, Quite a while that job finished, and we were taken back to the main camp. And then, uh, after a short period of time, I, I volunteered for another spot. But while we were out at Dunnerwall, uh, with the guards and, and the civilians, I hear him speaking in German. And, and I traded some cigarettes that I got from the uh, Red Cross parcel. Mm -hmm. I traded some cigarettes and I got a dictionary from German to French. And when I hear different words and you could understand by foot hand signals and so on what the topic was, uh, I'd ask for 
them tell me what the German word was. Then I got the French out of it. And having enough French in high school and so on, I was able to pick up enough so I knew what was going on. So, uh, with my dictionary, I volunteered to go on another work group. And this was a big one. Uh, they picked 160 guys. And they, uh, they asked me to be an interpreter. And I was the interpreter, and, and with a fellow from uh, South Carolina who had been captured in, in North uh, Africa. Uh, he was a medic. So we marched to this pretty good sized work group. You know? There we were, uh, there was an under officer and six guards and uh, the usual wires around the, on the small uh, steeple like thing. And they, uh, they brought us there and they said our job was going to be building road, a roadblock. And some of us were going to be building uh, the scaffolding that they were going to use to put the cement in. Some of the guys were going to be mixing the cement and the rest of the guys were going to lug it down and, and so on. So there we had, uh, we had two large barracks, eight rooms in each barrack with about 20 guys in it. And we went to work building the roadblocks. The roadblock. The uh, owner officer thought he was a pretty good operatic singer and he kept singing to me all the time. And I had listened to him. But uh, while we were there working on the roadblocks, a couple of things happened. We had some information. A fellow by the name of Jack D. Huff from uh, New Jersey. Uh, was in charge of uh, communications and he was also, uh, his job was mixing the cement for the roadblock. And I'll come to that later. But he had a friend who was a, a French priest and uh, he used to cool him in of what was going on. So one day, early, early April, uh, Jack said, uh, uh, the priest said that uh, Roseville dies. So uh, that was the, the evening. The next morning, when we lined up for appell, as they used to call it, which they'd count us out and take different groups to work, uh, I called everybody to attention and, and uh, said, face right, and they all face right. Somebody had, some guy had traded cigarettes to get, uh, get a bugle. He blew the bugle, taps. And I said, dismissed. And the other officer, he, he could hardly understand what was going on. So he said, what happened? I told him, Roosevelt had died. Uh, he was shocked. He didn't know how we knew. But that was one of our first wins at that particular place. How did you feel when you found that out? Pretty much upset. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt, you know, he, uh, he, he became quite a man once Pearl Harbor took place. He was on our side. He, he was the leader then. He mm -hmm. said this, you know, that they're not going to get away with it, mm -hmm. is what he said. That we understood. He, he was good. He, he was right, right for the times. And thinking you know, at that time, there are people who are really specially made for various times. It was Roosevelt, uh, Churchill, of course, De Gaulle, yes, maybe. But they were all, all pretty strong people at that point in time. And uh, although I, I couldn't vote for Roosevelt, because you had to be 21 mm -hmm. at that point in time. Right. You could drink when you were 18, but you had to be 21 to vote. It changed quite a bit. After that, uh, we had to, the Red Cross parcels came in. We used to be able to split them, maybe two boxes among 20 guys or something like that. And they had the various stuff that I think I would play new with cigarettes and soap and D bars and et cetera. And we got some uh, base softballs and, and bats from the YMCA. And we also uh, 
got a record player with two records. One was Into Each Life, Some Rain Must Fall, and the other one was I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. Well, they have a bunch of American guys over there. To, and we used to pass the Victrola around. It was a hand-cranking thing. Mm -hmm. Pass that around with the two records and so on. So uh, we, we had the balls and bats. And we couldn't do anything with it. We were working seven days a week. And so we could hear uh, the artillery. We were not far from uh, Stettin, which was in what was Poland at that point in time. The Russians were not that far away. They were almost to the Oder River, and we were not far from it. So we could, we could hear the rumbling and so on. And finally, in true American style, we had elected a, a, a leader in each one of these eight rooms. Uh, and, and myself, as the interpreter, we met in the eight fellows said, we, we decided we're not going to work anymore on Sundays. OK. And they said, OK, you tell them, Sunday morning, we're just going to go back in our rooms. We're not going, we're not going to work. And you tell them. So that Sunday, the guys did what they said they were going to do. Everybody went back in their rooms. The under officer, I'm standing there with the under officer, trying to tell them that this is a strike. We are striking. Well, I didn't know the word for strike. I, I just kept saying, Nick Moore, Nick Mir Arbeiten on Sunday. So he took me down to the guardhouse and uh, he called in the burgomeister, who was the mayor, and he called in a couple of major, major and they came up in a, in a truckload of 12 guys, 12 German guys, uh, all military guys. So I tried to explain to him. He said, no, you're going to work Sunday. So it became an argument. And uh, I, he said, I'll give you two hours off this afternoon. So I went back to the the representatives of our union, and I said, they going to take two hours. They said, no, all day, forget it. So down we went, I went back down again. And uh, this went on until about two o'clock in the afternoon. When outside, the, one of these groups of guys were having a drill or something, anyhow, a, a shot was fired. Somebody had a hair trigger or something, and it went up the end. The next thing I know, there's uh, two guards and a fellow, Earl Cross. Earl was from Oklahoma. He was half Native American, as they call him, half Indian. And uh, he had taken over the, and been the interpreter when we lost Hank on, on the, the previous job. Earl, Earl came down and he said, what are you doing? We thought you got killed. <laughs> Thanks a lot, fellas. You got me down here. But anyhow, the upshot was negotiating. I kept going back and forth. And finally, they said, okay, no more. I couldn't. My, my big ploy was you could hear the Russians. You could hear the artillery. Mm -hmm. The Germans were not in good shape at that point in time. This was, this was April. Finally, they said, okay, no more Sundays. So the following Sunday, and they put me in solitary for the week. The following Sunday, the guys are out there playing softball in the eastern part of Germany. And we were probably about two miles from a, uh, a woman's uh, stalag with Russian and Polish girls. And they used to walk by us in their blue and white uniforms and so on. Well, these guys are out playing softball. Or, playing softball and showing off for these girls as they walk by. It was, it was we never worked another Sunday after that. The only other thing that happened was that, that uh, when we were finally ready to show them what uh, the roadblock was, which was two, two pieces of cement going this way, each going halfway to the road so that you'd go through, but you couldn't come directly at it. So they had the Burgermeister there, and they had two guys with drums, and, the, and uh, we had the morning off. And some of the townspeople were out there, and they uh, 
at some speeches and everything. And they started to take the scaffolding, all the woodwork and everything. And something that the Huff, the Huff had told me that nobody else knew started to appear. Because up at the top is of, of, of one side, you could see a crack start. And then a little bit of cement stand would come down. The Huff had reversed the amount of sand and, and cement so that not very long this whole thing was going to fall down. He was putting in four or five times the amount of sand as he was cement mm -hmm. instead of the reverse. Well, everybody was pretty much upset about that. and uh, But that was the end of our, our work there. And we went back, uh, we were, uh, we didn't go back. On the 27th of April, which was just after this occurred when, about the robot, the younger officer came to me and said, uh, tell your buddies that uh, we're going to take off and we're going to take you guys to Denmark and we're going to continue the fight out there. I said, when? He said, tomorrow morning. So I told the fellas that we're leaving the next morning and uh, we're going to head towards Denmark walking. And uh, so the first thing we did was throw away the Victrola and, and uh, the two records and they, were, like, they went flying off. So the next morning we took off and uh, we had the six guards and uh, we worked, walked all that day going west and we, uh, we got to uh, got to a barn and we stopped there for the night. So uh, I went to sleep. The next morning I got up at daybreak and uh, a couple of the fellas came over to me and said, uh, we're ready to go. I said, well, where are the guards? They said, I'm sorry, uh, they're not with us anymore. And they gave me the owner officer's pistol, which I had always recognized him. So I kept the pistol. And uh, they left one guard, Kirk Popke was his name. And uh, he, was, he, he was the only guard left. So. We started going west, and we kept going through woods and everything, and uh, finally we looked, and the road was clogged with people. Everybody was going west, because the Russians were right behind us. So it was time to get out of there. So the men, women, baby carriages. So we went on the road. Some of the guys were pretty weak, and uh, had some bad legs and so on. So they... Uh, Kept looking. We finally found a, a horse alone, and uh, we, we got the horse, and then we got a wagon, and eventually we got uh, a couple more horses and another wagon, and we picked up a Latvian woman who said she was a barber from Riga, Latvia, and we picked up a 12-year-old little girl walking along, and she came with us. So. Uh, we kept going west, and periodically uh, the British and the Russians would strafe us. And the British, if you're going down the road, the British would go right down the road after you, looking, not necessarily hitting us or, or strafing us, but, but looking for any military vehicles or such. And the Russians would go crossways. They, they wouldn't pick out a target. They'd just go crosswise. So we, we got straight a couple of times. And some people, civilians got killed. And it, it, it was a real, real mess. I hid one time under a culvert, but it was still small enough to do that. But we finally got to a town called Tetro. We had Kurt with us all the time. And Kurt and I used to talk about beer and girls, because we were both 20 year old and I don't care where you come from, 20 year old single guys are going to talk about girls and, and beer. So we talked about that. He, he was always with us. We came to a town called Tetro, and we always
always had a couple of scouts going out, true military style. A couple of them came back and said, uh, there's a train leaving and there's room on it and we're going. Anybody else want to go? So I think there was a dozen of them took off and got on the train. And they took off. They were just ready to take off when the Russians came by and they strafed again and found the train and we lost these 12 guys. And now what happened to the Russian POWs that were in the camp with you? Did they the, travel with you or did they stay no, there? They had their own compound. Uh -huh. And and the Americans stayed in that camp and they were finally liberated by the, by the Russians. Mm -hmm. um, but each... Uh, the Americans had their own compound. The Russians had their mm -hmm. own, and they were treated terribly. Mm -hmm. uh, almost every day we saw them march by us uh, with a body covered in, in brown paper. Uh, the Germans uh, didn't feed them well, uh, and they just kept working. So. But anyhow, we, uh, we ended up, we reached uh, the 8th Division, the Americans. It took us a little over a week. I think we covered pretty close to 150 or better miles. We reached the 8th Division. They said, uh, I saw the MPs. And I said, what do, you, what do we do? They said, go find some place to stay. So we went to, uh, we took over an opera house. Uh, they still had Kurt Popke with us. Uh, they asked what to do with him. They said, keep him, we'll, we'll pick him up later. So after, five or six days why they came and said, uh, you, we're ready to take you out of here, put us on trucks, took, to, took us to a German airfield in Hild Hildes, Hildesheim, Germany, got on C-47s, took us to C-40, took us to uh, Namur, Belgium. I weighed myself then, I was 80, 88 pounds. From there they took us to Camp Lucky. How much did you weigh before that? About 120. About all I could lose. Uh, uh, took us to Lucky Strike, and then one day uh, they called us out. Ike was on a C-47 or something, on standing on the wing. Said anybody want to go home? And of course, we all hugged. Yeah. A couple of days later, I was on the SS Explorer, sleeping in the Fantail, the Liberty ship. Took us 12 days to get to Norfolk, Virginia. This, from there I called my mother, uh, shipped this to uh, Dix, then sent us home for 70 days, so I was home all that summer, 45, and then they sent me up to Lake Placid Club for R&R, &R. and at that point I lost a bunch of teeth. And uh, so I was up here at Lake Placid Tunnel Club with linen tablecloths, waiters and waitresses. Sent me then from there to uh, Camp J.T. Robinson down in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And I, I knew how to type, so they made me in charge of the typing pool. And I had 14 beautiful Southern gals working for me. I room with a guy by the name of Dean Williams, who later became a minister. And uh, I was discharged from there after I had enough points in December 1945. And went back to Niagara, finished up. The credits I had picked up at North Carolina State, they said we're okay at Niagara. Got my degree in October of 1946. February 1947, I met a beautiful young girl, a little uh, blind date. In June 19, 1949, we were married with four kids. Had 11 grandchildren, six great grandchildren at this point, and one more due. One thing that took place, the, 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 just back up a little bit, in, when I first got to Lindbergh, they took us in for delousing. So, um, we piled our clothes up and took us in the shower and they came out, poured all kinds of white dust on us and everything. And most of the clothes were gone. 
they took the American universe, and we couldn't understand why. And, and one of the pictures I have of Kurt and I leading, leading this group, you'll see GIs back there, and you wouldn't know what they were, because they had all kinds of outfits on, just clothes, some of them just wooden shoes and so on. We found out later that they used them for the Battle of the Bulge. Two other things, we heard about the Battle of the Bulge from the Germans, that they had taken Antwerp, and uh, one day, I think in, in, uh, back, back in probably in January or so, uh, I heard the first jet airplane go over me. I'd, I'd never heard of one, never seen one. And they were coming, the Germans were then coming out with the jet airplane. Let me stop you here. Okay. We have to change tapes.